Yeah, history is here to help. And I'm Jay Fidel. I'm here to help too. And Peter Hoffenberg is with me here today, history professor at UH, and he's here to help. And what are we talking about today? We're asking this question, it's a very hard question, and a disturbing question. Uh, is the United Nations still up to its job? Welcome, Peter. Uh, good to see you. I love the shirt. Thank you. Uh, everybody tells me that, including my puppy. Uh, okay. So <laughs> let me uh, let me ask you this: What what is the job of the United Nations? Uh, you know, we might have forgotten what that mm -hmm. job is. What is it? Right. Well, it's actually many jobs, which is not to not to avoid your question, uh, but many of your listeners will think of the United Nations born in 1945, but to a great degree, it's really born in 41 with the Atlantic Charter, and the the first and foremost goal is to preserve. Uh, freedom, peace, and security. But that's like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But that's the first and foremost goal. Uh, and then associated with it, like with its predecessor, the United Nations, it has uh, health roles, uh, economic roles, etc. So I think when people criticize, and there's been a lot of criticism recently, um, just as people criticize the League of Nations, you have to, we have to think about the various things it does. And in fact, it does some of those very well. So if we're in 1945, I mean, it really boils down to one question. We're in 1945. We've just come out of the most horrendous war in modern history, if probably not all history. Uh, it has ended with the explosion of two atomic bombs and the Cold War has begun. What's the first and foremost goal is to prevent World War III. And the United Nations has helped prevent World War III. So to a certain degree, it's first and foremost goal. And when people complain about it, they ought to remember uh, the number of dead and, and maimed, uh, the architecture and infrastructure destroyed by the Second World War. So that's my answer to you. Now, we can talk about the other things you're supposed to do. With goal no, no, with wait, wait, let me ask you to yeah. compare it to the League of Nations. Okay. Um, you know, it seems like big wars create mm, international governance and people come out of a big war and say, gee, we don't want that to happen again, uh, you know, never again sort of thing. And uh, so uh, the same thing that happened in 1945 also happened in 1918. Um, and, and Woodrow Wilson, uh, you know, gets credit for that, although, you know, he, he brings uh, some negative points into his legacy. Um, but you know what happened there? It was it exactly the same process or different? But, how does it okay. how is it similar right. or uh, contrasting with uh, with the United Nations? Sorry, right. excellent point. And, you, and your first point is absolutely correct. That at least in the last in the West, uh, so in the West I use expansively. In the last uh, what is now almost six hundred years uh, or five hundred years, that has been the response: catastrophic war and catastrophic for the point in time and people, right? So uh, very different with modern technologies has absolutely, you are absolutely right. One of the responses has been to negotiate some conference or treaty and the goal, among the goals of that conference or treaty have been to prevent war. So you're absolutely right. When we think about 1945, you're, you are again absolutely right that the First World War and the Versailles Treaty and the series of other treaties, Versailles was just the largest, most well known, but the series of treaties after the First World War also were absolutely right to try to prevent the next war. Now, historians will remind you that's kind of an easy thing to say uh, because it gets back right to what you think caused the war, uh, what you hope to gain by the war, <laughs> what you'd like your country's role to be after the war. And I'm sure all this will be familiar to any of your listeners. The most direct answer is the United Nations tried to self-consciously mimic what the League of Nations did well and avoid what they perceived to be the League of Nations failures. And I think, again, almost everybody listening, and certainly their parents and grandparents, will think that the major League of Nations failure was to prevent the expansion of Japan, Italy, and Germany. It also prevented the expansion of the Soviet Union. The argument being that those expansions provoked World War II. So again, you could argue that uh, yes, the Cold War essentially settled down to a new kind of domination, but the consequence of the Cold War and the consequences of that bipolarity was not World War III. 
Mm. So in that way, what the what UN said is we're going to have a security council. We'll have an assembly. Security council, you know, like in the US federalism has a, certainly has power that the council, that, that the assembly does not. But I think as a historian, and, and I hope people out there can correct me, uh, one of the most significant differences, well, two, I would say, the major powers participate. So many of the major powers did not participate in the League of Nations. By the time we moved through the 40s, there's no Soviet Union, there's no Germany, there's no United States, there's no Japan, I, I can go on, right? And secondly, well, well, we were we were the prevailing quick party. Quick. We in Britain right. were the prevailing party. And let me let me right. throw this into your mix. It, it seems to me like history is told through the survivors, and these international organizations are staffed by the people who prevailed in the war. Isn't it true? Absolutely. Let me just make one more point, and then I'll get to that. It's because you asked about uh, the relationship between League of Nations, the United Nations. One other significant difference is that uh, the League of Nations had no weaponry, no army. Uh, the United Nations, and I know people like to make fun of it, but we can talk about it because it has also had success. It has the Blue Helmet Army. So in 1945, people said, look, uh, Mussolini invaded Abyssinia, a clear violation of international law, and all we could do was have a trade embargo on Mussolini. So now in 1945, there, there is an army and armed force. Now, as far as your uh, point about uh, the victors, yes. Um, what we probably want to remember as well, though, that that was certainly the case at Versailles. But again, after 1945, there was an effort to ensure that Japan and Germany and Italy would return to the family of nations. So that's another lesson. And Germany, as you know, is partitioned. But this time, Germany uh, had an army. The rule was, though, until very recently, actually, that the German armed forces could not be deployed overseas. And it was the misguided American invasion of Iraq and the consequences of that in Afghanistan, uh, which prompted NATO, which included German forces, to go overseas. And those people interested in Japan know that the Japanese diet has been debating the provision of its post-war constitution was that it could have an army, but could not use it overseas. So those are lessons from 45, right? Because Nazis exploited uh, the idea that Germany should not have a navy or an army. In 1945, people paid attention to that for a variety of reasons, including the Cold War, right? If East Germany was gonna be armed, the West was gonna make sure that West Germany was also sure. armed. But let me go back to the League of Nations sure. for a moment. It didn't last very long. Um, and before you know it, the um, you know, the, uh, the Reichstag was burned and, and uh, Hitler was on um, a track to, uh, you know, create World War II. And it was only, you know, what, 10, 12 years um, of decline. And then bingo, we're back to a pre-war pattern. Um, so what, what went wrong with the League of Nations that it should fail so relatively quickly and be so inconsequential to the leaders of Europe? Well, I think that the direct... The direct answer is what I mentioned, that uh, the problems of the League actually did not start with Hitler. Uh, problems of the League started probably in Asia, and no League of response to the Japanese, the Sino-Japanese War, the second one, the one in the 1890s. And after the Marco Polo incident in the early 1930s, uh, neither the US or the, or the League had a response, and Japan wasn't a member. So what do you do? Well, one of the lessons, and this gets to the later in the 30s, was, as I mentioned, with no viable military response, those regimes are not going to pay attention. So you could argue that the legitimacy was initially challenged and overturned by the Japanese. Then uh, Mussolini's invasion of Abyssinia in 1935. And all along, Hitler has been expanding. He's usually been expanding though into areas which he claims as German areas, like the Sudetenland, et cetera. So you're absolutely right in 38 with Munich and uh, the West giving up Czechoslovakia and, and League doing nothing about that. That's when the Hitler card is added or the, or the Hitler card is taken away and the, and the castle of cards uh, is, is just destroyed and the League has no legitimacy. But um, I think that again, we're back to the first point that yes, the League, as we know it, was intended to prevent 
more. And that way it failed. But the league also helped in, in, to a great degree addressing human trafficking. Uh, we, they called it human slavery, we called it human trafficking. Uh, the league had uh, cultural interaction. The league had health interaction. And so again, when we look at the United Nations, right? Uh, we have things like the World Health Organization. We have UNESCO. Those are also born of league successes. But I think perhaps uh, when people sat down in 45, they recognized uh, that the way the UN is going to work is really just that everybody has to participate and you have to find a way. And that means the Security Council gets a veto. But to a great degree, the League of Nations was like the medieval Polish parliament, which had over 400 members. And when two decided they wanted to go home, the parliament was in recess. Mm. And the League of Nations was the same way. And that's part of international governance, right? If, if it's going to be shared, uh, it really has to be shared. You all have to buy in. And significant power, significant power is not buy into the league. Now, why so? I think um, two reasons, again, which make perfect sense to you. Uh, as far as expanding, we're talking about four regimes, uh, Stalinist, Soviet Union, which people really knew very little about, uh, Hitler's Germany, which actually, um, look, people were shocked at the camps. They, they understood expansion. Mussolini's Italy and the militarist regime running Japan. Now, you know, for better or worse, those are the regimes that caused the Second World War. And they're regimes which had no interest, right, in international order. <laughs> so you have, you have to convince regimes, right? Uh, I mean, China is a, the People's Republic of China is a member of the United Nations. So regardless of what China does, it, is, it has bought into, to a certain degree, this relationship. Okay, uh, secondly, and again, probably everybody out there is too old, but their grandparents would remember, there are two very different memories of the First World War. If your memory of the First World War was never again, you signed on for the League of Nations. But there was an equally powerful uh, memory going in the 20s and 30s. One was um, German memory that I really didn't lose the war. You know, Jews and bureaucrats and socials stabbed me in the back. So they have no interest really. Uh, the Nazis have no interest in joining. The Japanese and Italians uh, both thought that uh, they didn't get what they wanted out of the peace treaties, that they had joined with the allies. They were resentful. So you have these very powerful competing. And I think you can say you really don't have that after World War II. You have the Soviet Union who looks at it as a patriotic war and they've carved out a significant part of Europe and it's pretty hard to find anybody in Japan, right, or America who really wants, who, who feels like they missed out on World War II or that World War II should have gone differently. So the memory of the war, it's like the, it's like the US, right? I mean, certain people in the South have a different memory of the Civil War, right, than people in the North, and we're still fighting over that. And you can see the League of Nations is fighting over that in the 20s and 30s. So on the side of those who support the League of Nations, there were peace treaties that probably, um, I mean, nobody who doesn't spend their 24-7 you know, study European history. For example, a European diplomats outlawed war, the Locarno Pact. War could not be a legitimate political form. Uh, that was kind of built into the UN, except for a problem with the UN. And I don't know if you want to get into the problems with Japan eventually. Oh, I do, I do, I do. Yeah. I, want to, I want to tell you that when I was a kid, um, you know, in my preteen years, um, before the first, before the first World War, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. the Battle of Antietam. Uh, yep. uh, the our schools, um, right through school, would arrange trips to go to the United Nations building on the mm -hmm. East River. We would yep. have tours. We would look at the General Assembly building, a uh, rather an auditorium. We would go and <laughs> see the offices. Uh, we would meet the officials of the United Nations. We were so impressed. And this is all before, say, 1950, 55, like that, when I was a kid, and they would arrange these trips. And so I, I grew up in school thinking the world of the United Nations, that it was there to save us from another war. It was there to put humanity together as never before. 
there was it was the the highest most noble um, uh, collective of countries and people and mm -hmm. cultures and collaborative efforts from all around the world. But little by little, Peter, it slipped, and the geopolitics got involved. Uh, they they went through changes internally, externally, and there were changes in the countries that were you know members of the United Nations. And it didn't take too long after I graduated from what elementary school for the United Nations to be passive and quiet and uh, essentially going um, uh, under, underwater. Um, next time it uh, surfaces is, is in Rwanda where the blue helmets appear and then run away. And I think we all looked at that and said, what happened here? They have no clout at all. They have no chutzpah at all. They are not doing anything at all. What use are they? Um, and, and the Rwanda was, uh, you know, the Hotel Rwanda movie, if you remember, um, that was a statement that was really scary, because it, what it meant was the United Nations had come to another place, and it wasn't the place we hoped. And I think that has continued. It has it happened before Rwanda gradually, and then and then visibly to the world audience, but after Rwanda, it never got better. And so here we are, and Trump beats them up, takes their funding away. Um, their, their whole effort on the World Health Organization seems to be uh, ineffective um, and, and, and politically marginalized. Um, and I'm not sure they're doing a lot uh, these days. I'm not sure that the country's the membership uh, is actually supporting them. Uh, I think uh, if you look forward to crises, whether it's climate crises or uh, war or geopolitical arguments, um, you don't factor the United Nations in. Why? Because the Security Council is always arguing with itself and it's highly political and Russia sees it as a, as a tool and so does China see it as a tool and the rest of those guys just stand aside and they're wallflowers to what China and Russia do. And the United Nations, the United States has been ineffective in leadership. It has gradually let go. And it wasn't only Trump. It has gradually let go of its leadership position. So what we have now is a failed, or if you want to be charitable, a failing organization. I might add, before I stop, that there's the uh, you know, atrocities, yeah, yeah, right. human rights right. violations. Um, there's um, you know, war crimes happening at, at greater frequency and, and more places in the world than ever before. Uh, there are 65 or 70 million people in camps, displaced camps, and the United Nations is doing nothing about that. Uh, its efforts in dealing with atrocities are really minimal, and the atrocities are, you know, sort of getting hold of the situation, and the United Nations is unable to actually have an effect on it. So <clears throat> I, I pose all that to you uh, in the notion you will disagree with me about most of it, but that's my perception of where the United Nations is now. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about it, because I feel that we are at a tipping point where the United Nations is ready to go away. I will don my Adlai Stevenson heritage and my Keynesian heritage. And as my beloved Libby would say, uh, two things are true. Everything what you said is true. Uh, but so are some other things that are true. So let me address those issues. Uh, one of the difficulties of any kind of international uh, relationship, uh, be it a treaty uh, collected like the United Nations or a Congress, is whether or not members have the right to intervene in another nation's business. And in this way, the United Nations has tried to do what every single uh, treaty has had to deal with. Uh, before the League of Nations, there was a very instrumental 1815 Treaty of Vienna, which lasted until German expansions in 1870. But one of the principles of that treaty was you had no right to intervene in another nation's business. Now, so before we start talking about what the United Nations should do about war crimes, or what they should do about uh, human rights, or what they should do about civil wars, because most of these are associated with civil wars. I agree with you, the United Nations has not been as effective as it could be, 
but it is really running up against an existentialist problem. And you can see this particularly with China, right? China claims to be a member and it claims it has sovereignty. Uh, the only answer to this has ever been if the United Nations or the League of Nations or the Treaty of Vienna collectively intervened. Now, the Rwanda example is, a, is an excellent one of uh, the UN being outnumbered, outgunned, and the communications being misguided and, and gobbled. And that's not unusual for a military enterprise. I could give you Cyprus, where there has not been what everybody predicted, a bloody civil war after partition in the 1940s, and among people keeping the peace are exactly the blue helmets. Now, the second issue um, is that the UN has been successful in cultural issues. It's been successful in its food programs. It has often been successful in its refugee programs. What it has not been is perfect in any of those. But we can look at the UN as an outburst of optimistic internationalism or the reverse an outburst of Cold War Westernism, Westernization, and both are true, right? Historians of the 40s and 50s will tell you, uh, Keynes and others believe very much in internationalism, and others believe that internationalism was a good way to keep the Soviet Union at bay. So what's happened? The Cold War is essentially over. So if your justification for internationalism was to keep communism back, which certainly was among some people, that's no longer an issue. And we've seen, unfortunately, and you and I and Gene and others have talked about this, uh, the frightening explosion of nationalist populism. And nationalist populism, you know, be it Hungary or Russia or the United States, is always against cosmopolitanism, always against internationalism. So the UN is going to have to uh, find a way to negotiate in the post-Cold War world where, certainly in the West, many people have chosen Islamophobia to be their new red scare, but half of the United Nations, right, is comprised of Islamic countries who have the full right to be there. So that's not gonna work. That, that drum ain't gonna be beaten at all. And I think the United Nations has a very difficult time responding to ultra nationalist leaders. And League of Nations had the same problem, right? Well, yeah. But I would, I would really ask, I would ask your listeners though, before you toss the UN down the drain, if you're going to toss UN down the drain, you're going to toss down the drain, the IMF, the War Crimes Court, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, UNESCO, all these have to go down the drain as well. And I, I will sit here every Thursday from 12 to 1230 with you in our Aloha shirts and tell you the world would be a much worse place without those organizations. Not every refugee has helped. But those who have been helped have generally been helped by the United Nations working with non-governmental organizations. Uh, the internationalism of, of dress and food and language and health owes a great deal to the argument, like the, like the French doctors say, that there are, no real, there are no borders that matter when it comes to people's health. The problem is there are borders when it comes to people's security. And the UN has not found a way to say if there's genocide as a result of civil war, that violates mm -hmm. our 1948 genocide code and we have the right to intervene, but our army is comprised of members' armies. Remember, if you go look at a, a blue helmeted soldier, so those were Belgian soldiers in Rwanda, which already was a problem because Belgium, Belgium was a colonial power and there are plenty of people in black Africa who don't want to see any European troops, right? If you're on the West Coast, the last thing you want to see probably are French-speaking UN troops. They were there for 100 years, and they didn't do much good in those 100 years. So, you know, there are a lot of memories wrapped up in those blue But it's not a popularity contest. Uh, you know, uh, uh, how, many, how many people, uh, 700,000 700, people were killed in the genocide? It doesn't, doesn't matter what the popularity is, whether they liked them or not. How about living? Uh, 700,000 well, people lost well, the their lives. So the my, my point, though, is that, yes, security is important. And what we have now are these, uh, these ancillary organizations, which you mentioned, and they have a certain value, um, but they're not going to prevent a third world war. 
They're not going to prevent, um, you know, space junk, as we saw last week with Russia. <clears throat> we're, we're not, they're not going to help on COP26 or 7 or 8. They're not going to help. Um, and they haven't helped much on, um, on COVID either, and, and now Omicron COVID. And so, you know, there are great threats. Um, Navalny, they, they couldn't help on Navalny. They couldn't help on Xinjiang. Uh, they couldn't help on Hong Kong. They won't be able to help on Taiwan. Um, and all these things are coming down the pike. The United Nations will be impotent. It is impotent in terms of security and world order. So, you know, these anti organizations are nice, but they're not going to solve the problem or prevent us from a debacle, um, a catastrophe, a major consequence to humanity, which I think is happening on a slow roll, sort of like the frog in the boiling water, you know, it's happening. So my question to you, uh, you raised the possibility of, you know, throwing out the UN. Well, no, I'm not suggesting throwing it out. I just don't think it works. And so maybe you take all of those uh, ancillary organizations, you know, and you put them in one basket, and then you reform the other basket. And, the, and the, you know, so then you, now you have at least arguably a security council that works and you have a United Nations that has an army uh, that isn't worried about popularity that goes and does the job and takes the burden off the individual state actors who can't do the job. But my problem is, you know, these countries, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping and a number of others, uh, they're not going to buy into that. They want to retain, as you said, their sovereignty. They want to retain their power. They're not about to concede anything to anybody. They want to be in charge of their people. You know, don't come and bother me. You guys have to stay away. What was it, Metternich, right? Stay away from me. Don't don't get involved in my internal that's affairs. That's 1815, right. Yeah. Okay. So so what, what I'm saying is um, that the big issue is national, rather, is, is global security. And, that, and that's not just war, it's uh, security against, uh, against all manner of catastrophe. Um, and I, I would say, let's see what you say. I would say there is virtually no prospect that the United Nations under its charter uh, and under its um, you know, experience to date can re revitalize itself into an organization that is so altruistic that it can handle that part of the job, which we agree is the most important part of the job, both for the League of Nations and ultimately for the United, United Nations 1945. So my question is how, Peter, how? How do we, you know, the, the inhabitants of this planet make a, an organization that will effectively govern all people, all nations and avoid catastrophe? We, as in citizens of the United States, first of all, uh, make a public commitment to internationalism. That public commitment includes what uh, President Biden is trying to do and send vaccines to places that don't have them. Uh, FDR understood, uh, and I think that uh, Americans have slightly revised FDR's view. Again, FDR has its own problems, we recognize that. Uh, that U.S. must lead by example. Example means taking the U.N. seriously. Example doesn't mean you know charging the U.N. for rent and all these kinds of things, which are populist red meat. It also means, though, looking at the U.N. and recognizing that the assembly serves a very valuable purpose for countries to kvetch. And kvetching in public, rather than kvetching in public with weapons, it's a very valuable purpose. It's a large debating society. And believe me, I'd much rather have an angry government come and yell at the US than do other things, which it could very well do. That, that doesn't need to change. Uh, I think the Security Council and one country vetoing it uh, would be a good thing to change, but that's not going to change. So what has to happen is as it rotates, right, you want to try to get in the new member who's more likely to think about the UN in international terms. You're not going to change the Soviet leader, Russian leadership. You're not going to change the Chinese leadership. There are a lot of things about American leadership which don't, don't change. So what you're suggesting is actually very, um, 
Putin and Trump-esque is your suggestion. Because the alternative to the United Nations is to go back to the 19th century as de Tocqueville viewed the world, not like Kant viewed it. And he said, the world is basically a series of regions. And the negotiations takes place, take place among the regional superpowers. And each regional superpower lets the other one do what it wants. And that's a Trump, Trumpian view. And I hear echoes of it with you as well. Uh, you would like to change China and Russia, all right? But if, if world security, that is preventing the third world war, uh, one of the popular options is just carve up the world like the 19th century. And, and don't worry about the little guys. And you know you don't you can't really worry about what happens within other people's borders. Mm -hmm. uh, the world the world the world is probably more secure internationally without intervention. But Iraq is a good example of the unintended consequences of humanitarian intervention. The world is oh, not mis mis misguided uh, humanity. Well, but but you know what you know all interventions historically, as well guided and well informed as they are. And the U.S. should have had a few more Arabic than pushed on, pushed on uh, Urdu speakers, of course. Um, but uh, all interventions, all of them, always inevitably, the most well-intentioned ones, they all have unintended consequences. And they all have the tinges of colonialism uh, of around them. Yeah, I mean, and that's. But but let's not throw everything out, please. I mean, uh, no, no. But I want to tell you what I am suggesting. Okay. Okay. I am suggesting something. You know, it never worked better as when the United States, as the victor in both of those wars, was the international leader and, and retained its image to itself and to the rest of the world as the leader. And for as long as that leadership persisted, um, then things were okay. And things were certainly okay when I was a kid going down to the UN. Um, the money that uh, built that building is American money. Um, all the staffers and everything that you know, made all that happen, American generated, that's what was going on. Um, but over the years, American leadership has declined. And right now, I would say, and look at your own life and I'll look at mine, from the time I was a kid until now, American leadership in the world is, has, is really, really low. It's at a low point in my lifetime, actually. When I see what goes on in Congress, um, there was a journalist in, uh, in um, I Ireland, wrote for Irish Times, and he, he said, you know, what we, have to, what we have to feel about the United, United States these days is pity. You know, and that was picked up by a lot of other journalists, pity. So if, we, if we're the recipient of pity, we're not a, a global leader. We have to find a way to clean up the mess. Um, and it's not just Washington, it's all around the country. We have to find a way to clean up the mess and get along with each other and, and, and reverse all these terrible, horrible, evil trends that you see in the newspaper every day and become a leader, become a world leader. If we are again a world leader, the problem kind of resolves itself. It means that we will have the respect of all these countries, uh, if not the respect and at least some degree of, of awe anyway. Um, we have to recover. And once we recover, I think the world and the possibility of a world governing organization is dramatically increased. What do you think? I think uh, that's definitely a topic for a future discussion. Um, I, I would say that uh, you have a, a, a very pleasant but benign view of how the world looks at American leadership. <laughs> very benign view. Um, so, and, that, and that's a good discussion to have, I think, uh, an important, and an important one to have, because I agree with you that American political leadership uh, seems on a downward spiral. American cultural leadership, right, is on an upward <laughs> slope. And that may be part of the issue, that we've been very good about exporting American culture, American products. Uh, we haven't been as good about exporting but at least was built into the text of the Atlantic Charter. And that really is democracy and the ideas of democracy. We've been okay on capitalism. Most of the world is capitalist now, all right? But, and that's why I would love to have a chat with you and maybe bring in John to talk about American leadership because I don't 
disagree with you that the moral and democratic quality, but I also think that you know the American export of uh, democracy included supporting regimes in various places which were not democratic. Well, we can't make those mistakes anymore. No, but please remember that if you live in El Salvador and you live in Greece, that's your memory of the U.S. You know, your memory of the U.S. is not FDR. Your memory of the U.S. is Truman and Eisenhower. And, and if you live in Iraq, regardless of what you think about it, your memory of the U.S. is a heavy blow to your society. So I agree with you that we need to rethink and revitalize American leadership. But we need to do in two ways, right? We need to revitalize the democratic principles and we need to address uh, the anger and resentment that people have. Because there is legitimate political resentment towards the United States for supporting a long list of SOVs, a long list. Okay, and, now you know, it's, time. We... it's time for Charles Dickens. It's time okay. for the <laughs> ghost of Christmas future. Right. You know, so if I give you the coast of Christmas future okay. and we are unable, unwilling as a nation, as a people to do any of that. And we, we turn further isolationist, further nationalistic. We don't take any role at all. We, we follow the, the Trump mandate, the Trump legacy, however evil and useless it is. Um, and we are not on the world stage. We are not trying to reform the United Nations. We are not trying to influence the members of the Security Council. Uh, we're not giving them money the way we used to. What happens then in the world of Christmas future? Well, as an atheist Jew, I, I have no idea because I don't celebrate Christmas, but uh, <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about that as our sixth, seventh, or eighth uh, candle. Um, but I would say you're, you have, an, uh, let's say, an impassioned description of the U.S. in the 20s and 30s because the U.S. did not participate in the League of Nations. But as with the Republicans and the Democrats and Trump, et cetera, isolationism is always selective isolationism. So part of the exercise in thinking about US leadership is where was it applied? And one of the answers to that is please remember that FDR had very little difficulty uh, getting the US involved in the war in the Pacific, but there was not a lot of interest in getting involved in the war in in Europe, which reminds us that isolation in the 20s and 30s always included some intervention in China and Japan. And there's nobody in Central America who can tell you that America you know, didn't intervene. So we also have to think about well, what we mean globally. Do, do we really mean, do we really mean globally? That would be wonderful that you know, folks in the furthest centrality in New Guinea have fresh water. That would be wonderful. And that uh, genocidal maniacs are held accountable but the U.S. can't do all that. Uh, it either has to have your buddies who don't want to do it, or it has to have the United Nations uh, uh, probably arm itself. Uh, and I say that as a pacifist, prob probably uh, force will be necessary, or at least the, the pretext of force. And so in your lifetime, you remember NATO and the Warsaw Pact, right? That was an admission that there was a limit to what the U.N. could do, right? So we're going to set up all these regional and the regional ones are armed to the teeth, right? The UN, we're not so armed. So I don't know, maybe maybe we're back to a world in which the UN does what it does well. And then uh, as far as uh, security, we're back to again, regional relationships. I, I would, I hope we're not, but I, I can see looking at the news that that's, you know, the, the areas around China, they're aligned with the US vis-a-vis -vis China. But they don't really care about Germany, right? And NATO is trying to revive itself now against Putin. I, I think that makes for a lot of smaller armed camps and it takes one mistake. World War II did not begin in one area, it began in four areas and then they all converged. I am reminded of um, uh, Barbara uh, Tuckman mm -hmm. and the scenario that um, you know evolved before World War I where everybody was ready for it. And right. when anything triggered it, bingo, you had a war. Peter, wonderful discussion with you. I really thank you very it. much. As, as always, we, yeah. uh, let me know what you want to talk about in two weeks. Have a pleasant rest of uh, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever you'd like to celebrate. As long as you can eat, as long as you can drink, that's a good. That's a good holiday. Yeah, Peter. Peter Hoffenberg, history is here now.
Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.